Mother's Day um, of this year, if you, were, if you were in church, if you were in main service, you saw that there was a group of ladies that got together and they sang this song called The Blessing. And for some reason, like as Pastor Sam would say, that got me in the feels. Like for some reason, that song really spoke to me. And I thought, okay, what, God, what are you trying to say here? What is this all about? And so I sort of started this journey of figuring out what it means, what the blessing actually is in the Bible. And, and so over the next few weeks, we're going to take a look at what that means, what the blessing is. Now, um, disclaimer, we don't have time to discuss everything that the blessing is because it's, you know, it's, there's a couple hundred mentions of that word blessing. But what we're going to try to do is distill it down into a few points. And then I stole some things from a book, and I'll be sharing some of those things. So we'll do that this week and next week, and then the um, two weeks after that, we'll be kind of talking about what this means what it means to be a blessing, what the blessing is. I remember as a kid, um, and, and maybe this, I remember this a little bit older as I was growing up in the Lord and I, I was starting to, to really, you know, I was becoming an adult and starting to, we we're living on our own and that kind of thing. And I would go back and visit my parents. I'd go back and visit my grandpa. And I remember my grandpa always saying, whenever I would leave his presence, he would always say, God bless you. God bless you. And I thought, well, that sounds nice. Like, I didn't, I didn't really know what it meant. All I knew was, like, it felt really nice, right? It felt good. Like, I think that God blessing me would be a good thing. And so, like, as I'm thinking about what the blessing is, I'm remembering that. I'm also thinking about um, a, a minister, a guy that I knew when I was a kid. Um, he used to speak at all of our church camps uh, when I was in high school. And when you were around this guy, you just felt really blessed. But he would always say things. He would, he would always use this expression. He, just, he would always say, you're a blessing, you're a blessing. You're a blessing. I thought, yeah, like, again, like, I had this feeling of, like, I think I, I like what he's saying. Like, this makes me feel nice, right? It feels good. I didn't necessarily know what that meant, like, to be a blessing. And so what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks, as I said, is we're going to dive into what this means. And there's lots of ways we use, you know, bless or blessing or bless you. Like, when somebody sneezes, right, and we say, God bless you, right, like, so the, the old teaching is that when somebody sneezes, it's like their soul trying to leave their body. And so we say, God bless you, so that the soul goes back into the body. You guys heard of that? Like, that's a thing. Okay, that's not a thing. That, that's, like, not real, but, like, that's one. So we throw around this word, like, bless and blessing. Like, it's just become kind of really common. And so we'll look at what that means. And, and, and my, 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 one of my objectives is to give us really some really like practical things that we can use in our lives to be a blessing to those around us, like actual physical, like tangible things, kind of things that you can take home with you. So disclaimer, if you go to the next slide, um, I highly recommend this book. It's called The Blessing, right? And so rather than do all the work of doing the study, I just read what these guys wrote about what it means to be a blessing. So not, that's not true. I combined what I did with what these guys wrote. It's a super good book, really, really practical. Um, it's, it's a little bit outdated. Like it was probably 20, 25 years ago. It was really popular. They've written some updates and made some revisions. But it, there's a little bit, uh, some of the examples and statistics are a little bit old, but still very relevant for today. So the blessings. So let's start out with this. Let's start out with some definitions. A few definitions, and these are the ways that the word bless is used in the Bible. One way that it's used in the Bible is is sort of in the the same vein as the word to honor. So to bless something is to honor. It's also, it can also mean to like to add weight or value. So think of the old scale, right? The old scale shows value. If you have something heavy and weighty and valuable on this side, you have to balance it out with some heavy, weighty stuff on this side. So if I bless someone, it's like I'm adding weight or adding value to that person's life. Okay, that's what it means to bless. That's one of the ways that it's used. Another way that the word bless is used in the Bible is in Genesis 24, verse 11. And it says, And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. So the word blessing is not in that verse, but the same word as to bow the knee is the same word that's used for the word bless or blessing. Okay, so when we, when we bless someone, we add weight or value to them, or we, we bow the knee to them. So if you've ever 
You ever seen like a camel or a giraffe or a tall animal that has to get water? It has to like bend itself down. It has to put itself in a low position. Or a camel, in order for someone to ride, it has to put itself in a low position for that person to get on. So when we, when we bless, we add weight, we add value, or we bow the knee. So this kind of used together. So let's combine those into sort of our, our working definition of what it means to be a blessing or to bless. To bless someone means, here's what it's saying. It's saying, you are of such great value to me. You're so important to me that I'm choosing to add to your life. I'm choosing to put something positive into your life. I'm choosing to increase your value because you're so important to me. In, Deut in Deuteronomy chapter 23, it tells the story of, if you guys remember the story when, when Balak hires Balaam to curse the people, right? So Balak's the enemy of Israel, and he says, hey, could I get a prophet to curse God's people? Like, I don't like these guys. We need to curse them. Here's what, here's what the Bible says that happens. Here's God's response to that. Deuteronomy 23, verse 5 says, Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam. So Balaam is supposed to curse the people, but God wouldn't let it happen. It says, But the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. So choosing to bless someone is choosing to love them in the way that God loves them. So when we bless, remember we're adding weight, we're adding value, we're bending the knee. We're choosing to love someone the way that God loves them. God would not allow his people to be cursed by the prophet. God turned that cursing actually into a blessing. And so when, when we think about what it means to be a blessing or what it means to bless or to be blessed, it's like to be blessed is to be loved by God in the way that he would love us. And then to bless someone else is to love that person the way that God would love them, to, to want only good for that person, to want only what's right for that person, to want only what's biblical for that person. So let's take a short look at what the Bible says about the word bless. Now again, we're only going to look at a few mentions because we just don't have time, but these few things are going to show us, they're going to give us a good kind of base and a good foundation for what it means to be, to be a blessing. Genesis 1.22, the first time that the word blessing, or the word bless is mentioned. It says, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the fowl multiply in the, in the earth. So the first time we see blessing, God's talking to the, to the creatures of the sea and he's talking to the fowls in the air. Now, if you've ever had the opportunity to go snorkeling, to go scuba diving, to see a glass bottom boat. If you ever had an opportunity to like see under the ocean, to see under the surface of the ocean, you know that God's blessing on the things in the water, the creatures in the water, like it was a success. When he says be fruitful, like if you've ever been fishing, if you've ever been able to scuba dive or, or snorkel or look under the water, you know that man, God was successful. Like that blessing worked. There's lots of creatures down there. Or just look up to the sky one day and, and notice all the birds. You see the flocks of birds that go back and forth. Like, okay, this blessing works. So this blessing, God speaks, and there's a blessing. Genesis 1.28, it says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. A little bit later, creation's, God's done with creation, right? Genesis 2, verse 3, is going to rest. And God blessed the seventh day. Okay, on the next page, we've got Genesis 5, verse 2. And we get to where God blesses, uh, where God blesses Adam and Eve. So Genesis 5, verse 2. I'm going to go there. Genesis 5, 2. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Genesis 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons. So they get off the ark, and God blesses Noah and his sons, right? And, um, and he said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. So we're just going really quickly through the first part of Genesis. So what do we see? We see these patterns of God choosing to bless, and it usually has to do with fruitfulness. It usually has to do with multiplication. Genesis 12, verse 1, another, another blessing from the Lord. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. 
And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay, so we've looked at a number of verses. We've looked at a handful of verses where God uses this word bless, where it gets translated. So let's, let's make some conclusions. Let's draw some application about that. The first one is that the work of fruitfulness and multiplication require God's blessing. Okay, if we're going to do the work of fruitfulness, if we're going to do the work of multiplication, it's going to require God's blessing on our lives. Every time that we saw God say, every time we see the Bible say, and God bless them, and then he says, be fruitful and multiply. God blesses them, and he says, be fruitful and multiply. The second thing we learn is that God's blessing is intended to be passed on. Okay, so we have been blessed so that we may be a blessing to others. God sets this up with Abraham. He says, you've been blessed, and through you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And we're going to come back to that. When I was thinking about fruitfulness and the work of multiplication, we see that as a physical picture here in the book of Genesis. But we know that spiritually, in order to have spiritual fruitfulness, in order for us to multiply spiritually, it's going to require God's blessing on our lives. It's going to require God's blessing on our ministry. It's going to require that we submit to the Lord in prayer and that he moves through us. Matthew 28, when, when Jesus gives what we call the Great Commission, what does Jesus say, right? He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And then he, he says, therefore, because of that, because I have all this power, because I've been blessed with this power, I'm giving that power to you. And he says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. He says, go and do the work of discipleship. Go and do the work of planting churches. And then he ends it by saying, lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the earth. And so God puts this commandment, this, this commandment to be fruitful and multiply, this great commission, he puts on either end of that his presence. He puts on either end of that his blessing. He says, I'm going to bless you for the work. Here's what you're going to do. Oh, yeah, and by the way, I'm with you in the work. My blessing, my hand is going with you. And so anytime we get away from them, we try to do the work on our own, we're not going to be fruitful. We're not going to multiply. We're not going to, like, we're not going to complete the mission that God has for us. So fruitfulness, multiplication, they always require God's blessing. Let's look at another verse in Genesis chapter 27. In Genesis chapter 27, we have the, the story of Jacob and Esau. This is one of the most famous stories of like a blessing in the Old Testament. So the blessing in the Old Testament is this thing, you know, where, where the head of the household, the, the patriarch, would, would bless his oldest son. Okay, and that blessing was really, really important because that blessing was, was, was the mark of approval. That blessing was the, the you know, the, the admonition to go forward. And it was, it was adding weight and honoring the, the, the oldest son so that he could go and carry on the family name. But in Genesis 27, we have Jacob. So Jacob decides, Jacob is a schemer, right? Jacob is this, this heel grabber. He's this guy that's always looking to get ahead, and it's never like in the right way, right? He's this like used car salesman that's always trying to get ahead. He's always trying to get an advantage. So Jacob steals the birthright. Jacob steals the blessing, okay? And here's, here's Esau's reaction. That Esau's the brother that was supposed to get the blessing, Here's what Esau says. Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. So to miss out on a blessing, there are big consequences for that. So our next conclusion, it's a simple one, but it's a big one. The blessing matters. To be blessed by the Lord, to be blessed by our parents, to be blessed by God is an important thing. We see Esau weeping because he missed the blessing, because he didn't get it. Now, we have to remember that the blessing isn't some mystical thing. Like, it's not something that the priest does as he, you know, wafts out the, the incense and sprays you with holy water. Like, that's not what we're going to talk about in terms of the blessing. We're going to take the examples of the Old Testament and break it down into kind of its component parts. As I was thinking about the blessing and what it means to be blessed, I was thinking about those moments in my life where, where someone said something that was like really, really important. 
where somebody said something that meant a lot to me. And maybe you have those moments in your life where you can think back to that time when you were in third grade and you got an A on the thing and you went home and your, your mom or your dad said, I'm proud of you. Or, or where you remember the moment, maybe it was like your wedding day, and you remember your mom pulling you aside right beforehand and saying, I love you, I'm so proud of you. Or maybe it was you, you hit a home run on the baseball team and, and everybody was cheering your name and somebody said, well done. Or maybe you're getting ready for a big test or something was happening in your life. You were getting ready to go into the military, getting ready to go to school, or there was some big thing and somebody looked at you and said, I believe in you. You can do it. And you remember those, those words because those were words of a blessing. On the opposite side of that, you probably remember the times when you didn't get that affirmation. Or maybe you remember the times when somebody looked at you and said, you don't have what it takes. You're not going to make it. You're not good enough. You're a loser. You can't do it. As Esau is weeping because he doesn't receive the blessing, I think we can all relate to that because we all have those times where we didn't get the blessing, where we didn't get affirmation from, from our earthly father or earthly mother, from a coach, from a teacher, from somewhat, that we desperately needed that affirmation, but we didn't get it. And so the blessing matters, right? The blessing is really important. Let's go to the book of Numbers, chapter 6. Numbers, chapter 6 is sort of our base text for the blessing. So here's what's happening in Numbers chapter 6. The beginning of the chapter, God lays out what's called the Nazarite vow. So when you think of the Nazarite vow, think of Samson, right? So he's this guy, he's not going to cut his, head, his hair, he's going to abstain from alcohol, and he's not going to touch any dead thing. This is like the Nazarite vow. Like I've, These people, have set, they will set themselves apart to be used by the Lord. So God walks through that at the beginning of Numbers chapter 6, and then he gets to verses, verse 22. And here's what he says in verse 22. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons, saying, On this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. Here's what's happening in Numbers chapter 6, God's preparing his people to enter the promised land. So back in Exodus, right, they leave Egypt, and they're, they're, they're getting ready to head into the promised land. A few chapters after Numbers 6 is when, is when they're going to send out the spies. Moses is going to send the spies with Joshua and Caleb and the, and the ten others into the land to spy it out. And so these are some of the last words that God's planning on saying to them before they go into the promised land. Now we know that they, they mess that up, and they have to wander for 40 more years, but they're right on the verge. They're like really close to being ready to get into the promised land, and God's saying, here's some of the last things that I want to say to my people before they get in to the promised land. Right after Numbers chapter 6, we get the tabernacle completely set up. So God's given all these instructions to how to build the tabernacle, and it's getting set up, right? It's, so, so where we are is we're getting ready to go into the promised land, and the tabernacle is set up. The offerings are made. They're going to dedicate. They're going to sanctify this tabernacle. So let's look at some of the characters. Let's look at some of the people that are, that, that are, taking, that are partaking in this blessing, right? So we've got Moses. Moses is the mediator of the Old Testament or of the Old Covenant. What does that mean? He's the one. So God has words to say to his people. He has a covenant he wants to make with his people, the people are here, and God is here, and Moses is the one that hears from the Lord and then shares that message with the people, right? He's the mediator. He's the one. He's the go-between. But Moses has a brother, Aaron, and Aaron is a priest, okay? Aaron's the first high priest, and Aaron is also Moses' spokesperson. So you have an interesting thing happening in Numbers chapter 6. You have the Lord speaking to Moses, telling Aaron what to say. So he's saying, God's saying, I have this thing to say, I have this blessing I want to give to the people, but I'm going to tell Moses to tell Aaron to do it. So those are the people, those are the characters. So that's what's happening in the Old Testament. Let's, speak, let's speed ahead to kind of what, what this looks like for us. So Jesus becomes the Moses and the Aaron of the New Testament. What does that mean? 
Jesus becomes the mediator, right? Jesus is our mediator with God. So Moses mediated. He was the go-between God and the people for the, the old covenant. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. Jesus is also our high priest. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20 says, Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, who we saw way back in the book of Genesis chapter 14. So that's Jesus' role. Okay, so we're getting all this set up. We're going somewhere with this. For us, what does that mean for us? For the New Testament believer, we are priests with a message. So in the Old Testament, you had Moses and Aaron acting as mediator and priest. In the New Testament, you have Jesus acting as mediator, but Jesus has given us the role. He's passed on that role of priest, and he's passed on that role of messenger to us, to his people. Two verses to show you that. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Peter says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Right? So we have become the royal priesthood. That, again, that doesn't mean that we wear the garb and that we get the incense and that we, you know, we put on the, the breastplate with the 12 stones of the nation of Israel. Like, that's not what that means. What it means is that God is going to use people like us to be priests. He's going to use people like us to share his message with the world. Malachi chapter 2, verse 7, here's the responsibility of a priest. It says, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge. And they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. So you and me, us, as New Testament believers, we are priests. The role of a priest is to keep knowledge, to know God's word. To, it says, for they seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Our job is to be a messenger of what the Lord has given us. And this is all going to tie back to the blessing eventually. Like we'll get there. But I want us to see what our role is, because I think it would be easy to say, well, the pastor's job is to bless the people. God's job is to bless the people. Or, or you know, those old, like, dignified people that really know God's word well, that have been, like, that's a grandpa's job to bless people. But what I would contend is that the Bible puts us in that position as God's priests and messengers. And a priest's job is to take what we have been given, to take what we know, and to pass that on. Now, there's context to that. Maybe for some of you, it's you're called to preach. Maybe for some of you, it's you're leading a Bible study and you're passing on what God has given. Maybe you're a mom and you've got young kids at home and you're passing on the message that God has given you by teaching your kids the word of God and by praying with them. None of those is any more or less important than the other. The point is that you have a message. You've been given something of the Lord. You've been given a blessing of the Lord, and your job is to pass that on, is to make sure the people around you can hear that. So the people who wrote the book that I shared earlier did all the work for me. So for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to steal their material. And that is a, just a confession. I showed you the book. If you want to sue me, if they want to sue me, I don't have any money anyway, so it really doesn't matter. But what they did is they studied the word blessing throughout the Bible, and they distilled it down to five basic components. Every blessing in the Bible has a few components. The first component, the first thing that we see, the first thing that makes up a blessing is a meaningful touch. So if you want to be a blessing to those around you, to your kids, to your spouse, um, to the people in this fellowship, to the people, the rest of the people in our church, to whomever that is, you will learn how to give meaningful touches. The first time we see this, or a good example of this, is in Genesis chapter 27. Here's what happens in Genesis 27. This is, this is Isaac again. Okay, Genesis 27, it says, And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him and smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, See, the smell, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Now, in some ways, this isn't the best example because this is Jacob tricking his father. Like Jacob has, has made himself feel and smell like his brother Esau. But here's the point. In order to pass on the blessing, in order to bless his sons, 
Isaac had to be so close to them that he could touch them and that he could smell them. Like, that's some closeness, right? We, we were just in, in Honduras, and it's like, it's never less than 100% humid, ever. Like, Honduras is the place where you take a shower and you never dry off. You're just like, well, I dried off and now I'm sweating again. You're just like, you're just always that way. So there's just always this like low level of BO like that everybody has. It's, and for some re- people, it's like a high level of BO, but it's, it's, just, it's just there. Like you're, there, there's just sweatiness and like, and so what do you do when you're on a missions trip and you're like, well, all eight of us are gonna get into this van and we're gonna sit right next to each other. And man, I love Jeff Gray, but like you're sharing sweat with each other. You're literally like, is that my sweat or is it Jeff's? I can't tell. It's kind of gross, but you're close, right? You have this closeness. And, and, and in order to pass on a blessing, we have to have that physical closeness with each other. We have to be willing to touch, to hug, to high five, whatever that looks like, we have to be willing to do that. In Genesis 48, we see this again. In Genesis 48, this is when, um, this is when Joseph brings his sons, right? Ephraim and Manasseh. And he brings his sons to his dad for the blessing. And this is another example sort of of what looks on the surface like the blessing gone wrong. Because if you remember this story, um, <laughs> He actually blesses the wrong kid, like he gets his hands crisscrossed. Um, but that was actually God guiding the hands. So here's what we see in Genesis uh, 48, verse 10. It says, Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age that he could not see. This is Israel. This is Jacob. He can't see what he's doing. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. His grandkids get so close to him, like he can't see them. But he can bless them because he's touching them. He can bless them because they're in his arms. He's embracing them. He's kissing them. That's how close they are to him. Chapter, verse 13 says, And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So he knew what he was doing. It looked like a mistake, but he knew what he was doing. The point is, they were close enough that he's touching them. He's got his hands on their heads. He's embracing them. He's hugging them. He's kissing them. We see this in Jesus' ministry as well in Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, there's kids coming to Jesus, right? And, 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 and not everybody wanted the kids to get close to Jesus, you know, you see examples of his, of his disciples saying, get the kids away. Jesus needs to do the real ministry. Like these kids are a distraction. But here's Jesus' reaction to that. It says, they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of heaven sorry, is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Now, obviously, when we talk about a meaningful, when we talk about touch, we're talking about meaningful, appropriate touch. I don't think, I, I, I don't think with this crowd we need to talk about that a lot, but Touch has to be appropriate, it has to be in the right context. We see a lot from the example of Jesus, though, who says, as everybody was saying, the kids are in the way, the kids are a distraction. Jesus actually gathers them up and he embraces them. Another example we see from the life of Jesus is Mark chapter 1. Um, in Mark chapter 1, verse 40, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now, if you're a leper in the time of Jesus, no one touches you ever. No one ever. Like, you literally never get a meaningful touch. It just doesn't happen. So for this man to come to Jesus and say, Would you touch me, Jesus? Would you touch me and heal me? That was a bold statement. Right? Like, he could have been condemned. He could have been stoned. He could have been kicked out. Like, 
This was a dangerous thing for him to ask for, but this man, in, the, like in his bowels, in his gut, he knew that he needed the touch of Jesus. What does Jesus do? It says, and Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. So Jesus, in the face of a decision whether or not to touch the untouchables, Jesus is moved with so much compassion in his heart that he reaches out and touches the person that no one is supposed to touch. Let's get really practical. Let's talk about the importance of physical touch. I'm just going to read off some statistics, some studies, some things that, that I read in my research. Skin-to-skin contact for newborns helps regulate newborns' temperature, heart rate, and breathing, and it decreases crying. The correlation between anxiety, depression, and stress and touch is large and inversely related. What that means is that as anxiety and depression levels go up, the, stu- the, the studies of the people that have high levels of anxiety and depression have had low levels of meaningful touch in their lives. As levels of meaningful touch go up, stress and anxiety and depression go down. Touch can calm our nervous center and it slows down our heartbeat. Human touch lowers blood pressure and levels of stress. Touch triggers the release of oxytocin, which is a hormone known for promoting emotional bonding to others. The brain quiets in response to stress when a person's hand is held. The statistics show that people daily need meaningful touches. And the statistics shows that people need eight meaningful touches a day. I don't know who came up with that number. I don't know who did the study. But eight meaningful touches is what a person needs a day to be healthy. And when we're talking about this, I think sometimes the tendency is to think of this, you know, for men, it's like, well, meaningful touches, like, well, we know how we want those as men. Those are not meaningful touches, right? That's part of it. But I would say that as men, we need to, th- our, our wives need meaningful touches outside of the bedroom. I'll just say it that way. Our kids need meaningful touches throughout the day, throughout their lives. You know, if, if we are not providing meaningful touches to our children and to our loved ones, they're going to look for those meaningful touches elsewhere. Your young daughter, your young son is going to run to the arms of someone who's going to provide that for them because this is a genuine need that people have in their lives. If you're not providing that, if you're not the one to give those, then your son or daughter is going to go looking to someone else. We have to be the people that are providing them. Real quickly, I want to speak to the dads. And this is like a real like kind of niche thing. Like this is a unique thing. But this has to do with meaningful touch. There is a ton of research. And I'm, I, I realize now that I'm, I'm stepping out of the Bible and into the world of, of science. But I think we've established from the Bible that the blessing is associated with meaningful touch. That in order for Jesus to impact people, he touched them. In order for the blessing to be passed on in the Old Testament, there had to be touch. Right? So we've established that. Fast forward now. What the science says about wrestling with your kids, what what is known, sometimes it's called rough and tumble play. If you have young kids, if you're a dad, you should be spending time wrestling with your kids. Now this is... It sounds a little bit weird, right? Like, take your two-year-old, take your five-year-old, and throw them around a little bit. Literally, like, throw them around on the bed, wrestle around with them on the floor. Now, what's going to happen is your wife is going to think that you're murdering your kid. Like, your wife's going to hate it. She's not going to like it. Oh, you're hurting them. And she's... Ask her to leave the room. Say, hey, go read. It's cool. Go do something. Go for a walk. We're going to get roughed up a little bit. I think it's... Now, and this is, this is true for boys, and this is true if you have little girls as well. The science on this stuff is actually really quite convincing. So kids that get wrestled with, um, man, it does all kinds of things. It helps their working memory. 
Um, it helps their social competence, their emotional regulation, their self-regulation. Kids who get wrestled with as kids have lower rates of aggression as they get older. Um, wrestling with your kids will help them to set boundaries. Okay, it helps them set boundaries in physical situations. So you wrestle with your son when he's young. When he's 18, when he's 20, and when he's with his girlfriend, and they're thinking about being, you know, doing the thing, and they're going to be intimate, now your son has learned how to set boundaries in physical relationships because of what you did when, you were, when he was a kid. It also works on instilling emotional intelligence. So dads... Wrestle with your kids. I always say I'm going to wrestle with my kids until they can beat me. And I'm getting close to that. Like, I've got a 13-year-old and an almost 12-year-old. And when they get together and, like, work together, it gets tough. Like, it's, it's, they're getting strong, which just inspires me to stay in good shape because I can't get beat, beat up by my kids. Like, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Here's what Dr. Ross Campbell says. This is a guy who, who is a, a psychiatrist. He spent a lot of time working with, with kids, with, with teenagers and families. He says, in all my reading and experience, I have never known one sexually disoriented person who had a warm, loving, and affectionate father. Not one. He said, I've never met a person who was sexually dis disoriented that had a warm, loving, and affectionate father. Fathers... We need to be warm, loving, and affectionate. And that comes through physical touch. I think a lot of times we think that this is the mom's job because she's the nurturer. And moms are nurturers, and people need that touch too. But man, it's your, your young kids, they need to be roughed up a little bit. Out of love, of course. So the first component of, of a blessing is a meaningful touch. The second component, the second thing that makes it up is a spoken message, a spoken message. In, in John chapter 1, John chapter 1 starts out this way. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 10 says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. When God chooses to bless people, when God chooses to bless us, right? So we got through the Old Testament. God's trying to get his blessing out. God's trying to get his law established. It's not going to work out. God's greatest blessing, one of God's greatest blessings comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ, who was the spoken and the written word. Like, if you've ever been to a place in the world, or maybe you remember a time in your life where you didn't have access to the written word of God, your life was very poor at that time, right? You were missing out on a huge blessing. Places in the world where they don't have the word of God in their language, and those people are deprived of one of God's greatest blessings. So when God chooses to bless people, he does it through his spoken word and through his written word. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 2, this is when Jesus, this starts the Sermon on the Mount. This starts Jesus doing the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed and blessed. Like he's getting ready to do that. How does he deliver that message? It says, he opened his mouth and taught them. So if we as priests are God's messengers, we have something that, we've been, that God has given us. We have some data, some download. We have some words of encouragement. The only way to pass those on is through a spoken word. It's through a message. We have to open our mouths. We have to follow the example of Jesus. In Numbers chapter 6, right, we're looking at that example. God tells Moses to tell Aaron what to say to the people. The message of blessing has to be spoken. There's a, a band that I like called Need to Breathe. And if you listen to Need to Breathe like 15 or 20 years ago, they were maybe more Christian than they are now. They've gotten away from a little bit of it. But I like a lot of the things they say. So they have a, a song, 
And it's sort of about reconciliation. It's about two people that have been separated for whatever reason. And the song's called Reaching Out to Find You. But here's one of, the, one of my favorite quotes from that song. The line says, silence ain't the answer. It never makes the point we're trying to make. You ever give somebody the silent treatment because you want to teach them a lesson? What does the silent treatment say? What does it communicate to the other person? It communicates nothing. Or it communicates that you hate them. Like, you don't want to take the time to talk to them. So sometimes we think that silence is the key, right? Like, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just going to be quiet. And maybe there's a time for that, sure. But if you think that your silence is going to communicate something meaningful, I would say you're probably dead wrong. In the silence, in the absence of words, in the absence of your kids hearing words of affection and words of love and encouragement from you, they are filling their brains with what they think that you think of them. If you're not telling your kids explicitly that you love them, that you care for them, that they're a blessing to you, if you're not telling your spouse that, your loved ones, if you're not explicitly saying those things, that's allowing those people to just fill in the blanks. Right? They don't know. Um, Okay. Who in, like, the early 90s was listening to a lot of Garth Brooks? Just be honest. Who was there? Okay. I got a few. Kenny? No Garth Brooks? And No? All right. So, like, a few of you are going to get this, right? <sighs> Come on. The cowboy hat, and, like, the microphone, smashing guitars. Like, he was the man, right? So I'm in, like, third grade, and I'm listening to Garth Brooks. I, why? Because my parents did, and I grew up in the middle of nowhere. It's like what you listen to, right? Um, so he had a song that it was like one of, it's, it's like a real like sappy kind of song, but the song is If Tomorrow Never Comes. So the song is like, the, song, the lyrics go, if tomorrow never comes, will she know how much I loved her? And what he's doing in the song is he's saying, like, I need to be really purposeful in what I do and say so that the people in my life know how much I love them and care for them. Because he's saying, what if, what if I don't wake up tomorrow? Is my wife gonna, gonna know, and not just know, but like really know that I loved her? Is she really gonna know that I cared for her? Is she really gonna know that she meant the world to me? Because I can think that in my heart. I can know that in my heart. I can know that in my, I can have the data. Like I know that I love my kids. Like, we were out fishing yesterday, and there was some questionable people around. And, like, I'm going through my mind, like, what I'm going to do if something goes down. Like, I'm going to die for my kids. I will do that. I love them so much. And I think they know that. But have I told them? Like, a lot? Do they know it so much because I've spoken it? I think the same thing in witnessing, right? Right? If we preach the word of God to people, but we don't have the action, or if we have the action of living a good life, and I'm the guy at the company party that doesn't take the alcohol, or I'm the self-sacrificing one, and people know that about me, but I never open my mouth. Are people really going to come to Christ? Are people really going to get saved? If I show my kids that I love them, I work hard. Here's Here's what men always say. My kids know I love them because I work hard. I provide for my family. I go to work every day. I get up early. I go to work every day. I put food on the table. How about you tell them that you love them also? Your kids need that from you. Your wife needs that from you. Your husband needs that from you. I feel like I'm picking on guys today. Men, sorry. We get this messed up. Sometimes, well, it's for another time. James chapter 3. James chapter 3, we learn that the tongue is powerful, right? We know this message. We know this passage from James chapter 3. We put bits in horses' mouths, right, for them to obey us. We turn, it turns about their whole body. We have these ships, these giant ships that are controlled by a little rudder, 
The things that we say are powerful. They matter. Proverbs chapter 18 says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's how important our words are. We can bring life or we can bring death with the words that we speak. The authors of that book, The Blessing, say that words of blessing should start in the delivery room and continue throughout life. Don't say, well, I'm going to wait until my, my kid gets you know, their wedding night, the night before their wedding, then I'll really tell them how I feel. Or right before they move away to college, or right before that big moment, like that's when I'm going to work it up, I'm going to get this speech, I'm going to say these important big things, I'm going to tell them how much they mean to me, and that day might not come. These words of blessing, this spoken message that we have, should be a continual thing that's coming out of our mouths. And it, it can't be fake. It can't be, you know, just, just empty words. It can't be vain words. It can't be words that don't mean anything. It has to be purposeful. But there's no reason you can't start when you're holding your baby in your arms, telling them how much you love them, how proud you are of them, how much you want them to succeed in life, how much God loves them. So let's end with this. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 27, verses 27 and 28 say this. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. There are people in your life that you owe and I'm not saying money, and I'm not saying this is some debt that you owe to people. What I'm saying is there are people in your life, so if a blessing adds value to someone, there are people in your life who need their value increased by the touch, by the message, by the spoken message that you can give them. There are people that have been depleted by life. Their tank is empty. Right? And what they need from you, what they need from us, is a hug, it's a handshake, it's a word of encouragement. You have the good. Proverbs says if you have the good, if you have the thing, you need to give it. Right? If your neighbor comes to you and says, hey, I'm hungry, I need some bread, and you say, oh, come back tomorrow, I'll have some bread tomorrow. Maybe. Maybe your neighbor won't make it back. Your kid, your wife, your disciple is hungry for words of affirmation, is hungry for some sort of meaningful touch, is hungry to be blessed. And you have those words of encouragement. You have that message. You have the ability to pass that on. Don't withhold it. Don't hold back. Sometimes I think it's, we hold back because it's awkward. Like to look at somebody that, even someone that you love, to like say words of like, man, I love you. I'm praying for you. Hey, I was thinking of, when I was reading the Bible the other day, I thought of you when I read this verse. Like, it's kind of awkward. Until you do it enough and then it's not. Like hugging people that you go to church with can be awkward, right? It's like, hey, I barely know you. Like, until it's not because it just becomes something that you do. So let's make these things something that we do. When we meet again next week, we're going to go through, so in, in Numbers it says, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. We're going to look at what it means to bless, what it means to keep. We're going to look at what it means to have the Lord's face to shine upon us, and then for us to be able to pass that message of blessing on to other people. Father, thank you so much for today. God, you have blessed us in so many ways. Lord, you, when we were sinners, you reached out and you touched our lives. When we were untouchable and dirty, um, you crossed the line, the barrier, and you, you reached out and touched us. And when we needed encouragement, when we needed your word, Lord, you gave it to us. You sent your son as the living word. You, you gave us your word as the, as the written word. God, we have it. We can read it. We can know what you think about us. 
we can know, Lord, how you feel about us. I pray that you would give us all the, the strength, give us all the courage to speak words of, of life and encouragement and blessing to those around us. Lord, help us push past the awkwardness of some of those conversations. Help us push past the awkwardness of the physical embrace and of, and of being able to pass on a blessing through, through physical touch. Help us, Lord, with our kids, with our spouses, with our loved ones. May we, may we show them and tell them what they really mean to us. May, they, may we leave no doubt. Lord, you've left no doubt for how you feel about us and how you, how, you, how you think about us and how valuable we are to you. May we leave no doubt with the people that we love. In Jesus' name, amen.